It's all changed for Intel in the mainstream CPU market with a brand new 10th generation Core i5. Okay, maybe not all change. I mean, we're still using 14 nanometer processors with a basic core architecture that hasn't been uh, refined for like five years now. But hey, at the end of the day, it's all about performance. And I've had my eye on the new i5 10600K for some time now because fundamentally it should be the same, if not better than the i7 8700K I use in my own gaming PC. A chip that's still so capable, don't really feel the need to upgrade it quite yet. So allow me to explain how we've got to where we are uh, in the i5 space through a bit of visual storytelling using my favorite game for PC benchmarking. Sixth, seventh gen Core i5, the gaming champions for their time, four cores, four threads. K chips could overclock to what, 4.8 gigahertz or thereabouts? But you know what? More threads were needed for modern game engines like this to run smoothly. And that's what AMD's excellent Ryzen 5 delivered. Uh, the 1600, the 2600, these were great mainstream processors. Six cores, 12 threads, nice. Intel had to adapt and it did so by upping the i5 core count to match, but keeping hyper-threading off the table, a feature that remained in i7 territory. Six cores, six threads then. Intel was more competitive in gaming, but AMD was starting to make an impact as a more rounded processor great in productivity and still decent for gaming. Intel didn't really seem to take that much notice as 9th gen core was basically the same as 8th gen, with just a touch more frequency. Then the game changer. 3rd gen Ryzen comes along and, well, the rest is history. The Ryzen 5 3600 and 3600X are, in my view, the undisputed champions for the mainstream PC right now. Uh, perhaps not always in terms of raw performance, but certainly in terms of the cost of the overall ecosystem and the richness in features. Now, I'm not quite sure why two SKUs exist when performance is basically the same, but yeah, this is a really wonderful processor. It's frequently on sale at a great price and it's a superb all-rounder, great for productivity, good for games. In the ninth gen era, the top tier 9600 Ki5 was still faster for gaming, but the gap was closing and pricing wasn't quite right up against the resurgent AMD. Now we enter Intel's 10th generation, which essentially forces the Intel behemoth to push i5 further with what must surely be the last throw of the dice for these 14 nanometer processors. Still in six core territory, but now hyper-threading is thrown into the mix to match AMD. And this splits off two logical threads from one physical core with some pretty decent performance improvements. Now, as productivity software and game engines have embraced many core processing, hyper-threading or SMT as AMD refers to it, delivers uh, performance gains sometimes as high as 30 to 40 percent. So is this new i5 going to cause AMD any worries? Can 10th gen core i5 stop the Ryzen 5 juggernaut in its tracks? Some basic benchmarks first which highlight how things have changed as Intel gifts as hyper-threading. Cinebench R20 reveals a 7% single core performance increase gen on gen, rising to a more impressive 38% on multi-core. Now, Cinebench is AMD's friend, but it is telling that Intel's single core lead is minimal and the multi-core result is still in Team Red's favor. And while our internal sample is a 3600X, the cheaper 3600 is basically the same in performance terms. In our video encoding tests using this Rise of the Tomb Raider 4K comparison video, encoding speeds with H.264 and HEVC improved by 25 to 27% gen on gen. However, this essentially brings Core i5 into line with Ryzen 5, and H.264 is still a bit slower. These are the flagship Ryzen 5 and Core i5 chips we're comparing here, but the elephant in the room really is that much cheaper 3600, uh, which is mostly equivalent in performance terms. Strategically, this becomes especially tricky because the lower end i5s, uh, which will compete with the 3600, have clock speed reductions compared to the K chip we're reviewing here. And there are constraints uh, to using faster memory that don't apply to Ryzen. Unless you're going to be sinking money into an expensive overclocking Z board, which will run pretty much any memory you care to throw at it. So I really don't get this. The i5's official memory support is just 2666 megahertz in a world where 3000 megahertz kits are entry level stuff. 
The notion of buying a brand new board that actively curtails the performance level of DDR4 is nuts, and the idea that I'll need a premium level uh, mainboard just to access the rated speed of my memory almost sounds like a joke. But this is a K-chip review though, and we are benching on a Z board, and this frees us from all of these limitations, and we can put Ryzen 5 up against Core i5 on like-for-like -like terms. But I do feel that at some point, we should be taking another look at the mainstream market with actual physical limitations in place. So Ryzen 5 3600 versus a locked Core i5 that can't access high bandwidth memory. But still, let's dig into what we've got here. Does Intel still boss gaming? How much of an improvement is the new i5 over the 9th gen equivalent? And where does Ryzen 5 slot in? Well, as with my i9 review, we'll kick off with a bench that almost always shows Intel in the best light, Far Cry 5. It likes single thread power, as we shall discover, and we highlight the CPU performance by pairing it with the fastest GPU on the market, RTX 2080 Ti. By benching at 1080p, 1440p, and 2160p, 4K, we can kind of simulate how these processors work with three different tiers of GPU. So RTX 2080 Ti at 4K, broadly equivalent to 1660 at 1080p. So Far Cry 5, let's get back to that. By a bizarre chunk of fate, the Ryzen 5 is actually faster than Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 in this one. The junior engine really doesn't seem to fully embrace the concept of many core processing, especially on AMD hardware. Anyway, on the face of it, it's a pretty conclusive win for Intel here. 10600K has a 25% lead over Ryzen 3000. And it is a full Intel win here as 9600K is only a couple of points off the pace. Intel still faster at 1440p, but the 9600K still has obvious stutter. Only at 4K do all of the processors act equally. Effectively, at this point, it's no longer a CPU test. We're benching the 2080 Ti almost exclusively. If Far Cry is a good test of single core power, Ashes of the Singularity's GPU agnostic CPU test under DX12 is a decent multi-core stress test. The i5 delivers a convincing 19% lead over 3600X, but the 8-core 3700X is actually the overall winner here, with a 4-point lead over the 10600K. Additionally, this bench highlights the importance of hyperthreading. The new i5 has a 22% performance advantage over the old 9600K. We'll return to this one a bit later. Crisis 3. Think of this as an exercise in stressing both single and multi-core performance. So this bench is actually an engine-driven cutscene, but this Vista, and indeed the gameplay that follows it, stresses all cores and threads. It's a game that historically demonstrated quite spectacularly why AMD's 6-core 12-thread approach had bigger gaming benefits over Intel's old quad-core i5s. If Far Cry is Intel-friendly, Crysis is more indicative of the advantage of many-core chips. This is reflected in results, where the 3600X actually beats the 9600K by 3% on average, but with more consistent frame times overall for a smoother experience. The new i5 can only deliver an 8% lead over AMD's mainstream champ. Switching to 1440p, the i5 is still discernibly faster and more consistent, with the 9600K still left for dust. One thing I want to highlight though, across this benchmark, the different chips react in different ways to different workloads. At the beginning, the delta between the CPUs tested is minimal. I mean, look at that. And now look at this. The delta is now in the 30 to 40 frames per second region. Now I've been saying this for years, but I still think that just generally we need a better way to review CPU gaming performance. The average frame rate metric, I do like it when we see consistent load across the bench. It kind of makes sense to me then. But the role of the CPU clearly changes radically depending on the tasks asked of it. One thing's for sure though, at 4K, we're no longer benching the CPU anymore. Graphics is at the forefront, hence the identical readings. Once again at 4K, this is more of a GPU benchmark. Next up, a stress test that is pretty consistent from start to finish the CPU-bound nuclear disaster that is Kingdom Come Deliverance at ultra-high settings. Hard to think that this is a more refined version of the CryEngine we just saw running so well across so many cores just a moment ago. But hey, we put this one into the test suite when people kept saying that 60 frames per second wasn't an issue for any CPU anymore. Frame time stutter here is quite something. 
at 1080p, the new i5 is around 15% faster on average than the old one, but there's only a 5% delta in the worst 1% scores, the highest frame times. Remarkably, the 3600X has a similar lowest 1% score to the new i5, even though the average sees the new i5 deliver a 26% lead. Bizarrely, that situation does seem to reverse as we power on into 1440p where the 1060K is dominant. 4K, yes, the CPU still has a role to play, though stutter is clearly reduced across the board. On to The Witcher 3 now, which is a game that's hardly known for punishing the CPU, until you start to visit some of the title's larger towns, and they don't get much bigger than Novigrad. Gen on Gen at 1080p, 9th Gen is only around 7% slower than 10th Gen, but again, the stutter you'll experience is much reduced thanks to the hyper-threading provided by the new i5, which is a solid 22% faster than 3600X on average. Worst 1% scores do close the gap though. So yeah, another example of a game engine providing more consistent performance through access to more threads. When we look at 1440p performance, Ryzen 5 3600X and 1060K are very similar in nature, graphics serving to equalize the experience significantly. However, the stutter on the old 9600K is still observable, still pretty bad there. This is where I think the big upgrade comes in. As I said, more threads can provide more consistency in game engines that distribute work evenly over more cores. So we have a big, big bunch of benchmarks in our text review over at Eurogamer, link in the video description below. This covers both the new i5, the new i9, along with plenty of old favorites. The highlights I've demonstrated here do a pretty good job of demonstrating that Intel is back in the game in this crucial market segment. Productivity is closer to AMD than prior gen Ryzen 5, while gaming pushes the existing lead further while delivering palpably smoother performance. Yes, hyper-threading really does make a difference. Okay, so you might have noticed that while I've been focused on 3600X comparisons, the Ryzen 7 3700X has also snuck its way into the gaming data. And the reason here is pretty straightforward. It's a chip that has sale prices that put it into contention against the brand new 10th gen i5K. In this scenario, you'll find that the 3700X is significantly faster in a range of non-gaming tasks, simply because it has an extra two cores and four threads. However, generally speaking in gaming, the i5 does still seem to be faster. Looking at our data here, the performance differential seems to be around 10% on average in Intel's favor. With that said though, specific tests like The Witcher 3 and Far Cry do see that gap rise to 20% in favor of the core architecture. The exception is, as mentioned earlier, the Ashes of the Singularity CPU benchmark. Based on this result, 3700X is actually four points to the better over the i5 10600K. Difficult one this, AMD is traditionally more agile on pricing and this throws up a ton of choices where Ryzen simply makes more sense than Core. And it all depends on how important gaming is for you. Returning to the i5 though, some notes now on memory bandwidth with a straight shootout here comparing the new i5 and the Ryzen 5. We've got two memory frequencies here, 3600 megahertz, 3000 megahertz. And there's quite a gap in terms of how much money you'd need to spend to upgrade to a higher speed kit. But what's the impact on performance? Ashes of the Singularity, not exactly a high profile game, but as RTS titles go, this one really stresses processor technology. Thousands of units here, jobs distributed over all cores and threads, running with 3600 megahertz memory versus 3000 megahertz. Well, the same CPU running at the same clocks delivers an extra 10% of performance. The difference is actually lower with Ryzen 5 at 7%, but the fact is that, as I mentioned earlier, with AMD, I don't need a high-end overclocking board to allow these modules to run at full speed. In fact, in the Ashes bench here, Ryzen with 3600 megahertz memory is basically running as fast as the i5 with 3000 megahertz memory. Now, let's imagine that i5 running on a non-Z board. It's highly likely to be slower than Ryzen because memory bandwidth tops out there at 2666 megahertz. Crazy stuff. Locked chips, the non-K variety, can run with faster memory on a Z board. 
but on other boards, memory bandwidth is locked to the limits of the chip. And I think this could have repercussions. In terms of overclocking, uh, the i5 has the same improved heat spreader and thinner die as the higher end models, plus access to new features that include disabling hyperthreading on a per core basis. Lots of tweaking for enthusiasts then. And with a stock 4.5 gigahertz on all cores, there should be some scope for improvement. So let's dig into some results here. Curiously, I didn't actually see much difference with the new i5 running at 5 gigahertz versus 4.5 in Far Cry 5. But here in Ashes of the Singularity, well, this is quite interesting. I get a 16% boost to performance. So yeah, maybe overclocking is worth some investigation on the i5. And there's certainly more headroom than there is on the i9, which has a 4.9 gigahertz all-core turbo anyway. Okay, so let's round all of this up then. I think this is a big upgrade going from 9th gen to 10th gen. Hyperthreading adds between 30 to 40% in terms of productivity performance increases, which is pretty good. There's a clear boost to gaming frame rates too, with an even better boost in terms of smoothing out those worst 1% frame times. Thing is, the Ryzen 5 3600 is so good and so potent, and it already comes with a decent enough cooler out of the box. The surrounding ecosystem has PCI Express 4.0 support, and it doesn't artificially limit memory bandwidth on lower end boards. So yeah, AMD has set the bar high there and I still think that Intel hasn't quite caught up. Obviously, the i5 is faster for gaming and that's great. And this new i5 is broadly equivalent to my i7-8700K and potentially even better. So yeah, pretty awesome. But that's it, that's the review. Intel is still the king of gaming but this is in best case conditions with a K-chip and super fast RAM that locked chips on locked boards may not have access to. And I do think that there is a follow-up review uh, worthy of uh, looking into there. But in the meantime, please do like and subscribe to support the work we do and ring the bell for instant notifications when new DF video content is posted. Our Patreon, that's there for those who want to support us more directly in a world where YouTube ad revenue alone will not pay the bills. Joining us gives you pristine quality downloads of everything we do and that warm and fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're making content like this possible. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for reaching the end of this one, the apex, if you like, of this video presentation. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.